2017. Um, and he's here to talk to us about uh, design, photography, and all that good stuff. So please welcome uh, Gary. Thanks, everyone. Um, can I step away from the microphone? Yeah. I've got quite a loud, loud voice, so I don't know if you can hear me. I quite like walking around as well. Um, thanks for having me. I feel like this is a tough crowd with photos, so let's just get this sorted. I haven't credited all the photographers. In fact, I kind of did a lot of this in the last 24 hours, so um, the pictures are from all over. Whoops. Let's go back. The pictures are from all over, and uh, if I remember who the photographers are, I'll say it, otherwise I'll be able to pull together a list afterwards. But I apologize profusely uh, to the photography audience. If you have like, tomatoes to throw, let's get it over with. You, know? <laughs> you may even see some of your own photographs in there, and if that's the case, I really, really apologize. <laughs> okay, so um, I was on a bus one evening, and uh, I was coming from a party, and it was a, it was a bus in London, and it was a particularly important party for me because it was my going away party. I'd been living in London for 10 years, and I decided that I'd had enough for a bunch of different reasons, and I wanted to move back to Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I was on the bus, and then uh, my phone rang. And this was sort of 2000, so actually my phone did kind of look like that as well. Um, and on it was this guy called Alex Smales. Um, I knew Alex because he was a family friend. Uh, his mom and my mom went to school together. I also knew that he briefly dated my sister. Yeah? Yeah, the mic. It's Tobago, can't you? Oh, I'm sorry, Tobago. <laughs> you could walk around with it if you like. Yeah, I can. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. so uh, I knew that he had briefly dated my sister. I knew he was a cool guy and had a connection to Trinidad. Um, but other than that, and he was a photographer, other than that, I didn't really know too much about Alex. And he said, hey, Gareth. And I said, hey, Alex, uh, how's it going? And he's like, what you up to? And I'm like, well, funnily enough, I'm moving to Trinidad tomorrow. And he said, well, that's really interesting because I'm moving to Trinidad as well. Um, why don't we meet up when we get there? And I thought, well, that would be great. Let's do that. And kind of hung up and thought, well, that's kind of a good sign because it means that other people are moving to Trinidad. I've heard some good things about what was going on and also, you know, I saw it as a bit of serendipity but didn't think too much about that otherwise. Um, Alex was moving as well because he was about to start working on his book, um, which I eventually ended up designing for him, Trinidad and Tobago. He'd got a, a bit of an advance, I think, from Macmillan and he was heading over to begin working on that. Um, anyway, so back to the bus, right? Uh, so I knew that I was doing the right thing leaving. I had been working up until then uh, with a, a group of magazines um, owned by this youth culture publishing company. And one of them was called Sleaze Nation. Uh, we worked a lot in fashion, uh, design, photography. Um, I was in charge of what was called the New Media Division at the time, which would now be called the Digital Division. Um, it was fun, we thought we were really cool. Uh, but the reality is, is that it was all pretty vacant as well. And by the, by the end of it, I was really ready to come back and try my hand at actually being a designer. I'd been managing designers. I wasn't trained in design. Um, I'd seen them work really, really long hours, really hard, not get paid anything. And so I thought, well, that's a great thing. I'm going to do that. Because it looks like it, it must be really fun, right, if they're going through all of that. So I'd come back to Trinidad. And I got back. And it seemed like there was a lot of opportunities for designers in Trinidad at the time. Um, so this is an ad from, from when I first got back. Um, I'm actually kidding, this is from last week. <laughs> uh, no, actually it's from the future. Um, so basically these ads are always going to be there and you, know, you can't really change that. But you know, there was opportunity. Uh, there's always been opportunity in Trinidad. It's a, it's a thriving place. But uh, in, and then among graphic design, I thought, hey, I've got a chance. Let me give it a go. Um, so I started this company called Above Studios. Uh, I didn't have a computer, so I was working from my mom's back room. So when she was sleeping, I'd boot it up, I'd get like a pirated copy of some Adobe software, and I'd teach myself how to design. Um, I called it Studios because it felt like a good creative thing to do. Uh, above was, you know, above the board, above your expectations. Uh, it's not because I thought I was better than everyone else, because, you know, I really wasn't. And uh, quite a while people thought that there was a sort of a religious connotation as well, like I was sort of getting inspiration from above too. And, and I, I don't think that there's a god of design, and that, that wasn't part of it either. So for a while, I kind of got jobs from friends and worked on web stuff. Sorry for the quality of images. These are 
Uh, we had a few servers crash, so these are kind of grabbed from random places. But you know, I do some pretty, I think, mediocre work, collaborating with agencies, getting straps here and there. Uh, meanwhile, Alex had been taking shots and getting bits of work, some from kind of commercial spaces, uh, others sort of advertising. I think you'd be really devastated if you knew that this was appearing on the screen now in 2019. But I mean, I feel the same way about my early work too. You know, we were all just trying to make a living, right? Um, but he was also in the background working on his kind of cool stuff, uh, his Mike Man stuff, that would then go on to be part of the book and would give him not just the commercial, but the artistic kudos, which really formed a, a central part of the narrative of a buffer. So, you know, we hung out a bit and we decided that it would be a good idea to share some space. So we moved into Mamatoto, uh, which is a birthing center uh, on Clifford Street in Belmont. They had a room that wasn't yet being used for birth, and so we thought that would be a really good place. Uh, there was a quite a long room, it was a very sort of low ceiling, uh, but it was good enough for Alex to do a couple of shoots in there. Uh, by then a friend of mine called Sam Clement from university, who was a sort of a programmer, had come out and so we were doing, I was doing design, Sam was programming, and Alex was doing his photography, but we were all working independently. Um, it was it was cool, I mean, Belmont's a really good place, it wasn't as busy as it is now, and uh, we really enjoyed the time there, but we really needed more space. Um, and so, we were really over the moon when a space came up at CCA7. Um, now, CCA7 wasn't looking for a commercial operator at the time, uh, it was really artists only, but Alex, was also doubling as an artist. And so we managed to get in through him. He said, look, I'll apply for the space. I'm a photographer, I can take sort of, I can have, I have that artistic side as well as that commercial side. And so we were able to get into this new studio that was being built up there, which was really amazing because first of all, we got to share space with some really awesome people, uh, some, some really interesting people from all over the world. Uh, as artists with uh, really kind of unique ways of seeing things which had a really profound effect on all of us. Um, we were able to carve out a space, uh, we set up a studio, we painted everything white, uh, we painted the floor with marine paint because it's the most sort of uh, resilient white paint that we could find. Uh, we got some, well, made some cheap furniture and we were kind of set up there. Um, the other thing that we had was a curve. So it was only a small studio but there was a curve in there and that meant that uh, Alex could use it as a photo studio, uh, but it also meant that we could then rent it out to other photographers. Um, and with other photographers came, you know, lots of people. This photography, let's face it, photography is really cool. And it's not just the production aspect of it and the models and the makeup and, and all of the sort of account executive types and creative directors, but there's a kind of a, you know, there's a sort of a kudos that comes with it. I'm sure you, you know what I'm talking about. And it created a really nice atmosphere because while we were sitting in there doing our design work, there was also this constant traffic of people coming in, sharing their stories, and, and really allowing us to kind of build up our tribe a little bit in Trinidad. Um, we also had lots of really good coffee, and uh, people would, you know, the coffee cup was always empty because people were just coming in just to drink coffee and sit back and talk. You know, this is sort of pre co working spaces. Um, so much coffee, in fact, that one, we ended up hiring someone whose sole job it was to make coffee. I mean, that wasn't like their job description, but that's literally all they did, because there were people constantly coming here. We should have thought of a better way of doing this. Anyway. <laughs> we were still operating independently. I took uh, Above Studios, turned it into Above. Sam and I now working together. Um, we were doing design and technology, and then there was photography. There was studio rental that we sort of shared, but other than that, we were keeping it separate. <coughs> Um, Alex finishes his book, uh, and he's looking for new opportunities. So we start finding ways to collaborate. Um, now, if, if you're looking for a nice intersection between photography and design, editorial is a pretty sweet place to start, because there's editorial, there's the typography, there's the grids, there's the layout, but then there's also the photography to go in there. So we started with a couple of uh, boutique publications. Um, we became creative directors for Macro Destinations. Uh, Nisha was a really, really supporter. Um, and that was a that was, again was a really good space to be able to collaborate between photography and design. We couldn't use only Alex's photographs in there. We, we did try, but you know they insisted on other people. Um, but it did mean though that there was always a photographic element in there, and that we had a, a photographer as part of the creative direction team, which was kind of unique at the time, um, having someone in at that level uh, making strategic decisions. Uh, 
One thing that we found, though, is that you know we really enjoyed working together, but the projects that we really enjoyed working on uh, were the ones which we had full creative control over. So the ones that came from ad agencies didn't really appeal because they came with handcuffs attached. Their agencies really have their sort of idea on what they're doing, and they don't necessarily trust their suppliers. Um, but where we could deal directly with clients or initiate the projects ourselves, we would certainly have the most fun. And also it was the most profitable because we could use Alex's photography, our design, we built out the website, everybody was happy. So there was a kind of a, a commercial sweet spot. Um, and that kept on going for a while until we decided that we should take the plunge. So we merged our practices and we became a buffer. Um, there are a couple of good business reasons for this. So one is that, that design is a kind of a long cycle uh, um, business from a cash flow point of view. So you get a chunky deposit, and then you have to rule out the project, and if it's editorial, it takes quite a while, and then at the end of it, you get this big check. But in the meanwhile, you've got this sort of lull in your cash flow. Whereas photography tends to be quick commissions, you get it done, you do your shoot, you get paid, you move on, and um, while the overall sums aren't as much, it was happening more frequently, which means that, that our cash flow was able to be supported in between these long cycle design projects. So there's, there's a kind of a natural overlap there. We were also selling a little bit of stock on the side as well, and again, that sort of, you know, it wasn't a lot of money, but when you're kind of starting up your own business, like anything is good, you know, from a cash flow point of view. Um, the other thing is that, you know, having that reliable, cap, that more reliable cash flow meant that we could actually get salaries. And until then, we'd kind of been glorified freelancers. Um, you know, we said that we had a company, but really, if a job came in, we'd kind of take the money and, you know, we'd split it up between us and we'd, we'd kind of go home with it. Now we were paying ourselves salaries, and, and for those of you who've made that jump from being a freelancer to being salary, um, you know that it's really terrifying, but it's such a wonderful feeling at the end of it, because it means that you have to carve out a certain amount of stability in your, in your work practice, and that, um, it's, it's hard, but it's also really reassuring as well, once you've got it up and running. Uh, we needed the stability too, because by then, um, you know, we were having babies, like, well, like, Alex was, not. <laughs> so I was having a baby with my partner at the time, and then Sam was having a baby, and so we needed that stability, because we were sort of, you know, we were like growing up a little bit, right? So, um, the other thing that happened with uh, coming together is that we were able to start taking on staff. Um, so at first we followed this, uh, like the photography model. We would get in a photography assistant or a design assistant. Um, they wouldn't know much, but they would really love what they were doing. And we would um, train them up, give them opportunities to work with brands with, on, on sort of really interesting shoots or uh, you know, projects that they wouldn't normally have access to. In return, you know, you paid a stipend. It wasn't very much money, but it was kind of a learning experience. And, that really spread and it really helped us not just build our own business, but build the career of a lot of people who came through a bug group afterwards. Um, so business is good, right? Uh, but, but we had a problem. Um, the, the problem is, is that we couldn't really figure out how to describe what we did. Uh, because it's, it's really hard to tell people, they're like, oh, so a bug group, what do you guys do? And we're like, well, we do design. Uh, and under design, we do editorial design, we do environments, we do a bit of identity work, uh, we do photography, so that's like commercial, that's editorial, uh, we have some stock as well, with, you know, we do digital, so there's websites, and uh, we don't want to forget like the business application stuff, and then of course we, we like have a studio that we rent out, you know, it, it was hard talking about it, because it was so many different things all coming together under one roof. Um, the, we, we use the word design because design kind of felt like it covered everything, you know, like everything has a little bit of design. If you think about something strategically um, and it has a sort of a visual or a creative output, then chances are you can probably package it as design. Um, and we just really like that word too. So we're like, okay, it's design, multidisciplinary, but it, it didn't really stick. Um, so we, we had this issue, we just couldn't figure out how to talk about who we were. And um, that really kind of freaked out Sam, uh, the, the tech partner. He, he just really felt that there was there was no hope for a business which was trying to bring all these different things together. It just it just wasn't going to work. And so he, for a, a couple of other reasons, but that being the main one, he cashed out uh, and moved back to the UK. Uh, in in that process, becoming the only person to leave above group with any money as well. So good on Sam. Like the, you know, get out first basically is is a lesson. Um, so we had this problem and. The, 
the, the problem really was not that we didn't know how to talk about ourselves so much as we we lacked a story, and uh, you know stories are really 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 important. In, in fact, you could argue that uh, stories are one of the most important things that have happened in the history of our species. Um, if you if you think about you know some of the great stories, the stories the great stories are the ones which have lasted throughout long, long, long uh, swaths of, of uh, human history. Uh, the ones that are written down in books like this, uh, the ones that then become our moral code, our, our legislature, the, the way that we tend to live our lives in societies, these are all really just collections of stories. I mean, there's no sort of tangible thing like law or morality. These are just a bunch of beliefs that people have, that they come together, and because enough people agree about it, it's accepted as being true. But these are all actually really just stories. If you think about like Trinidad and Tobago, um, the Trinidad and Tobago is, is really just a story as well. Um, you know, you have one island, Trinidad, the other one, Tobago. They don't really seem to have a lot in common from a, a, a geological or geographical point of view. Um, even culturally, they're quite different. You know, some, some might say that Tobago is a little bit closer, hi Tobago, one might say that Tobago is a little bit closer to uh, Grenada, certainly from a geological point of view. But yet there's this story which says that we are one entity, Trinidad and Tobago. And because enough people believe it, people who live in both islands, but also the global community believes that story, it is accepted that we are this place. And part of our story as well is that we have these colors and we have this bird and this is important to us. But really, is that really what it is? Like if I scratch the ground here and I go down through the soil, there's nothing that's written underneath there going, this is Trinidad, or this, should, this is red, red, white, and black. It's just something that we all happen to, to agree on. It's a story. Money, money's a story. Because money is just a, a, a bit of paper. Um, it, it really doesn't have any value at all. But it has value because enough of us believe the story of money. Enough of us believe that that actually has some value. And we believe the story that Something called a central bank, whose governor is signed there at the bottom of the note, will honor the value of that note. It's a story, but it's not really anything tangible. Um, even, you know, you know the story of Isaac Newton um, and the, the apple falling on his head when he discovers gravity, or he writes his pencils, his theory of gravity, but you know, what if gravity itself is a kind of a story? Because is there really anything called gravity it's a theory that enough of us subscribe to, but is it really real? What if there was a completely different narrative that all of us believed in? I, I know it sounds a little bit out there, but I, I'd like to think that everything is kind of composed of stories, and the more people that believe it, the more true that it becomes. So one day, we found our story. We were approached by this guy, uh, from this company called Terraforma. His name was Al Campadu. Uh, and he wanted us to do a little bit of web design work. Uh, we, met this, uh, we met him in this sort of office in Belmont. He was really sharply dressed. And uh, Val is this property developer who had this idea for this mega project in St. Kitts. And it was going to inspire creativity, life, and leisure. Um, it was this sort of funky multiplex thing which uh, did lots of cool things. It had a recording studio. There were artists that were going to be there. Uh, it didn't exist, of course, it was on paper, but um, they had sort of nice drawings that were going to sort of supplement that. Stylistically, uh, probably not something that we would agree with, but we thought, well, why not? We'll take it on as a website. We'll use the assets that we were given, and you know, we'll, we'll kind of make a go of it. We weren't quite sure what they were trying to achieve. There were lots of different things that they were trying to pull together that didn't really make sense. Like, it's an investment opportunity, but yet there's a recording studio. Uh, you want to have artists. Artists don't really have that kind of money to be buying high-end property in some kids. And then, whatever, like, we needed the work. So we started doing the website. I'm really glad this is a low res because it was a really awful website. Um, and uh, look at those colors, you know. Um, so, yeah, like, our hearts really weren't in it. Uh, and, and, you know, it, what happened is after a couple of months, Val completely pulled the plug. And uh, his UK partners, who were this sort of high-end property development marketing company, said, you're going to have to do something about this. This just isn't going to work. We're not going to be able to sell this to the high net worth individuals that you want to sell it to. So it was pulled, and it all went quiet for five or six months until we got a phone call saying, you can come back now. And there to present to us in Belmont was a company called Heavenly. 
uh, Heavenly were a UK branding agency. And uh, they had been hired by Val and his, his guys in, in London to, uh, to redo the branding for Petition Heights. Um, they sat us down, there were these two guys, they were like so London with like their funky glasses and stuff, you know, they were like, rah, 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 we know everything. And they sort of started presenting and they said, well, you know, we've looked at Petition Heights and, you know, we've, we've done all the research and all the stuff that you said, you know, what you said. And, then we've kind of condensed it down into this sort of central idea about what Petition Heights should be, and, and then we've rolled it out into fonts and colors, and we've done the branding, and this is how we've done it, and you guys uh, are being commissioned to redo the website and to go to some kids and do some photography for it, which is great. So they, they basically did the branding, and, and they were showing us stuff, and the central idea that they came up with was that Petition Heights was, was a natural high, and um, you know, all the other people in the room were like really giggling to themselves. They're like, ha ah, ha, natural high, it's like a ganja plantation, ha ah. ha And Alex and I were just sitting there really quietly. And we were just sort of looking at each other. And when we left there, we knew that we had found our story. And that Petition Heights had found their story as well. We realized that branding was the answer. Because branding was an amazing umbrella under which we could put all of these different things. There was strategy, there was design, there was photography. It was this perfect package. And more so, no one else was doing it in the Caribbean at the time. So, bingo, we found our story. We were going to be the first branding agency. We were focusing on design, but this was it. Of course, branding is, is all about stories as well, right? Um, I, I think most people, young people who are buying Jordans don't really even know of a, of a person called Michael Jordan, but that's all part of the story. And, and, and the Nike brand, which really isn't about, about footwear so much as it's about lifestyle, it's about a belief in yourself, a belief in a certain type of community, and so on. Uh, you know, Manchester United, uh, you know, whether you like them or not, you know, they've been around for a couple hundred years, but it's really about a collection of stories. It's about victory and loss and amazing characters and downfall and Dwight York and other stuff. Um, and you know, the yellow and the red, that's all kind of, that's all part of it. But really, Manchester United is a story more than anything else that happens to also manifest itself in football games. But for the, for the person in sort of rural India who, who supports Man U, um, they're not seeing any of the games, really. What they're doing is they're buying into the stories of Manchester United. Uh, you know, when you look at things like, like uh, fully digital brands, you know, it's quite interesting finding this picture because you very rarely see the Amazon logo made out of something, right? Because it, it really just exists in pixel land. It doesn't really exist, but yet it's a story that we all agree with, that brand. We know that it represents having access to everything in the universe that we could ever want to deliver to our door you know, as quickly as, as possible. So brands really are stories, and if you tell it well and convincingly in a clear way, you get people on board and um, they, they resonate well with your brand and uh, they buy more of your products and they endorse you. So we had found our story and we, you know, we went off to St. Kitts and we helped petition uh, Heights uh, come up with their story. That was really fun, that shoot. Um, our own story began to evolve. We doubled our studio space. Um, we weren't just about branding, but because of our, um, you know, our sort of artistic side, uh, we also started hosting talks and events like Show and Tell, um, which was kind of expanding on the above group story. Um, we, I mean, it seems a little pedestrian now having yoga in the studio, but uh, at the time it was really important to us because our clients would have to step over us practicing yoga. And it was really a big part of our story that our clients were not more important than the well-being of the people who worked there. Um, and that was a really important signal to send about our independence, but also really where our priorities lay, and they lay with, with us and our community. You know, the, the, the people that we hired, this Lisa Marie Brown, who ended up um, kind of running operations, Adam Cooper, who started as an intern, uh, then went on to become our sort of strategy director, and now is a really successful sort of DJ out in LA. Um, Stephen <coughs> Gill, who's a photographer who'd come down uh, through Alex's photography contacts. Kafra, who I, I guess everyone knows, everyone seems to know Kafra. Um, there were really lovely people around, like Jennifer Smith, uh, Katinka, who was a, a designer who just heard about us. Uh, I think she'd come over on holiday and had heard about us in Tobago, and had come across just to find out who we were and ended up staying for almost a year. Um, the, the, having photography and design at the forefront was also really useful because we, 
we spent a lot of time taking pictures of the process of what we do. Like design is seen as being a, a very, and branding as well, is seen as being a very sort of black box thing. Uh, you know, you don't know what it is, just, you just put in some money and out of it's gonna come amazing stuff. And we were really keen to open up and share um, what we did with as many people as possible and document it using an amazing photographer. So when Diwali would come around, we would just buy loads of theirs and we would arrange our logo on the ground and we'd climb up on the roof of Fernandez and shoot down and, you know, it didn't really, you know, well, it came out looking, out looking pretty good, but it was also about the story of doing that and about constantly trying to reinvent and push, push each other. So I would have an idea and design that would push Alex's photography or he may be experimenting with a new kind of light. And uh, we would then find a way of feeding that into a new project that we were working on. There was a sort of lovely way of, of collaborating that also involved a, a lot of great people. Um, you know, Matt's hair came out to work with us from New York for free for, for ages. Uh, you know, he was the creative director at Wolf Holland. You know, he, he, he went on after this to, um, to rebrand USA Today, which is where I think the blue circle thing started coming in. You know, amazing people who are like, I don't I didn't even want to be paid, I just really want to be part of this story of what you guys are doing. Um, show and tells. Uh, yeah, it was, you know, um, what's his name? Diplo came down. And, you know, again, it's like adding to that story. Uh, Elena wrote this up and sent it to her friends in, in Russia. I just don't really know what it means. Anyway, I think we got a little bit um, wrapped up in our own story. You know, we were. We started branding our own coffee, and I think we started getting a little bit carried away, and that is the danger with with believing your own story too much. You know, it's like, yeah, okay, take it down a notch, right? Um, but we were growing, and you know, at our peak, we were sort of 65 people. You know, it, it became quite a quite a sizable business by local standards. Um, and then, of course, there was all the work. So design coming in with photography would produce things like the work for the Carlton Savannah, where the branding was about getting light in at a particular angle. Uh, of course there was you know, all the sort of traditional branding components, but really the brand lived through the photography. And Alex was really experimenting at the time with shooting into light, um, doing tricks with the light, and, and that's what happened. Um, so that would massively inform the branding, it would find its way into digital, which allowed us to then bring videographers into the fold, technical developers into the fold, um, and create a really lovely ecosystem of kind of like-minded people pushing each other on. Uh, the Film Festival was another kind of good example of design and photography uh, meeting. Uh, a lot of the early um, posters were Alex's, taken from Alex's photos, and we were just on it, you know, and we were having really good fun, again, just pushing each other, seeing how far this could go. Like, I don't know what it would be like to shoot something, someone wearing a wedding dress on the board. Okay, let's, like, let's figure out how to do that. So we'll sell it to a client as part of a bigger project, and then let's figure out how to shoot it. Things got better as well, I think, from a design point of view, when Marla and Darbo joined. Because until then, I had really been heading up the design, and i have been doing that while also kind of building the business and kind of doing a lot of the leadership, and Marlon really brought a kind of a, a serious design credibility, and I really think after Marlon came on the, as a part of the design work, just went, and it also freed me up to, to like do stuff like this, you know, go and announce brands and kind of be awkward in front of um, lectins and things, you know. Um, I think other work, uh, like Beacon was an interesting one, because again, branding is about a story, so the story with the Beacon branding the, the lighthouse is that the um, the chairman really likes lighthouses. That wasn't a really very good story, right? It was quite a hard story to kind of go out and tell people. So we're like, okay, well, there are lots of different lighthouses. So we found the lighthouse on Shaka Shikari. We redrew it as that. That's a great story. It's one of the oldest lighthouses in the Western Hemisphere. It connects uh, Trinidad and Tobago with uh, the rest of the Windward Islands. That's what Beacon does. It sort of moves from its headquarters here up through the islands. Suddenly there was a story. Um, that we could then take and run that narrative with and create all of the imagery and typography around that. Um, this is work that Alex and Marlon did for Mount Urban Bay Resort. Um, again, it's sort of a, a, a really nice sweet spot between the narratives, the narrative potential of photography, 
and that of design. It spread to you know, mobile applications as well. This is some work that we were doing for UE. Um, again, the brand is about connect. There's a certain style of photography. Uh, at the time, everyone thought filters were great. I, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, Rebranding of optometrists, optometrists today. So even little things like having a, you know, a good photographer on for simple product shots or having great images to use in our proposals created a, a really good positioning difference from us and our competitors. You know, everything kind of looks smart because as, as any designer will tell you, you know, that you can only go so far with grids and type. If you've got amazing imagery to work with, it takes everything to another level. And I mean, you know this, right, because of, of what you do. And, and, and having these sort of resources as well allowed us to take on work which wasn't particularly well paid. Um, to, you know, take it to, I think, all of the branding and some of the app design, all of that was done for $5,000, including the launch and everything. Um, but, you know, there were some good interns from the university and we just wanted to have fun and also show people how to, you know, how to work in this kind of environment. So we, we paired up with uh, one of the departments there, which allowed us to have their people on secondment and, anyway, Having people on staff allow us to do these things in a kind of a creative way and take on projects that we wouldn't do traditionally. Um, like the rebranding of Lisa. Um, at the time, Alex was really into uh, running around with an iPad. This was during the... So, thanks. Do you have any questions? So there are a lot of non-photographers here tonight, actually, like a lot of people in the arts, a lot of people who own businesses here, Gareth. And I think they came hoping to maybe hear something about how imagery might impact their lives. So the story of about group, I guess, would be one where you embrace imagery, you embrace the photography, you see the importance of different facets coming together to create a success story. So, you, you know, and I don't know if you could speak a little bit about how you translate that into like an everyday business. Okay. It's not maybe art oriented. Okay. Um, maybe if someone gave me an example, so something that someone is working on. So what you're looking for is a way that we can use imagery to take an entity, whether it's a business or a brand or uh, like a, a charity or whatever it is, and use imagery and design uh, to to create a story around that. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Well, give me an example. Um, Pilates. You have a Pilates studio owner. Okay. Um, <laughs> oof, this is a little impromptu. <laughs> um, well, what, what's the name of the studio? Uh, my name, Madeline Miller Pilates. Okay, and uh, how do you go about promoting yourself? Oh gosh, social media. Social media. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so I mean, I, I guess I could give an idea as to how I would approach a project like this. Would that help? I'm not just going down. And so I suppose that the thing to do would be to to get to know you, uh, to get to know your customers, interview your customers, get a better sense of what they like where the, the challenges are, where the opportunities are. Um, I think then uh, a competitive analysis, so looking at the people that you're directly competing in, competing with, but also looking at the other people within that space who uh, are competitors for time as well. So they may not be Pilates studios, but maybe you, you know, there's only a finite number of people. So some people might be doing yoga, some, might be, some people might be doing other sorts of wellness activities. Um, what are they attracted to in the competitors and what can we learn from that? Um, I'd also look at uh, sort of global trends. So what's been happening in Pilates? Who are the sort of, what's like the, what's the apple of Pilates, if you will? You know, what's sort of the mega, the mega brand? Uh, what's going on from a trend point of view? You know, Pilates has been around for a while, but is it evolving and what's...
So basically you're saying, what's the story, what's the story, what's the story, what's the story? Well, essentially that. Right? Yeah, what's so the story of the brand, what's the story of the people, what's the story of the environment? And when you can answer all those questions, you have an you know, answer. Absolutely. So it's really about it's really about unpicking what the story is, you know, and 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 you'd be amazed at how many companies like I've been to where they really have no idea what their story is. I mean, I'm talking about really big companies, you know, Guardian Group. They didn't really know what their story was. It took them a while to figure that out, you know, because the truth is is that we're all uh, we're out there trying to do the best at what we do, and we're good uh, we're good writers, we're photographers, we're we're business people, we're, we're newspaper editors. We, we do these things and we do them as best as we can, but we don't really have the time or the resources to figure out how to fit those into a broader narrative. And that's when having someone else from the outside comes in. Um, and it's, it's a nice process. It's a way of bringing people together. I mean, like if you theme, uh, I mean, I, I hope everyone has been through at least one existential crisis, right? At least one, right? <laughs> this week, right? You know, it's, it's not fun, right? It's not fun kind of not knowing who you are, why you're there, what your purpose is. But when you figure that out, it's amazing. It's, it's transformative, you know? You shoot off like a rocket. You're like, what was I thinking, you know? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm not meant to sell insurance, you know? I'm, I'm meant to run a Pilates studio. And you have these big pivots because you suddenly have clarity. You know, when people say alcoholics have moments of clarity, when suddenly you realize you've been doing everything all wrong and something, a, sh a shaft of light comes through, and you're like, yes. And so similarly, you know, branding is like that with, with companies, where you've been kind of carrying on with a certain amount of momentum doing what you're doing, and, and suddenly this, this story becomes clear. Um, can I ask a question there? Hi. Just as an example, you know, you have Okay. Um, so, a lot of that was done through photo editing. So Alex was the photographer for the first year, but then the film festival chose photographers in later years. Um, Abigail, yeah. were you one of the photographers? Yes. Yeah, twice. Twice, okay. Marlon James was one. Marlon James. Uh, Keepway was one. Keepway, um, right. So every year they chose, I mean, I can't say yeah, sure. Um, sorry, hi. Um, only because I worked for the film festival for what, four years. Um, so every year we would, um, make a list of photographers who we saw in the scope. So what the main thing would be that we need we needed to be in the public eye as and someone knew. Like we needed to know that you're a photographer. So if, for example you don't have a portfolio online, if you don't have a presence on Instagram, then we wouldn't know that you're a photographer to even be like, let me approach you to see your body of work. So what we would do is we'd have a meeting um, and we throw out ideas based on photographers whose work we would have been familiar with throughout the year. Um, and then we'd look at their work online, wherever it was, so online portfolio. Um, and then what we do is we send uh, an email out to the photographers um, saying this is our theme for this year. So every year the film festival has a different theme. Um, and so we would say this is the theme this year. Do you have any images that you think reflects this theme? Um, and it doesn't have to be literal because the main thing that, as you said, it's all about to be used for that year and it would be used for everything related to the festival so the image became the brand a little bit more than the logo so like when you saw alex's um blue girl with the the camera that became like the thing that you knew represented film festival for that year um i don't know if that answered the question mm, yeah so it was uh, the image would be used on the festival guide um, about 200 to 1,000 of those were printed and distributed across Trinidad and Tobago, so it was always a cover. It was on postcards, about 10,000 of those were printed and distributed all over. Um, it would be on the movie town um, board for the film, so the movie, the billboard that where the film poster goes where you went go to movie town and you see what film is showing, so we would have one of those in there. Um, we had a relationship with drinks, so it would go in the drinks, big drink lounge bistro on the corner of Warren and Rob. Of overexposure, I think. Too many people got into it, and um, it just became hyper-competitive. So, I think the fate of branding is certainly there's, the, the, there's a bit of, of oversupply. The other challenge that branding faces is the commodification of design. Uh, it means that you're not getting particularly good work, but it's harder and harder to sell someone a you know, $100,000 project when you can uh, go and get a series of $5 logos online. Um, and like everything, there's a, there's a question of, of uh, education. So 
Of course, everybody can go and get a free image online or pay, you know, get something from iStock. But there's also a reason why people should work with a photographer to get a sort of a custom piece of work. Similarly with branding, it's a question of education. The question, the, the, the real challenge though is around uh, digital. So brands increasingly don't really live in the physical world, they tend to be digital brands. And that's had an impact on aesthetic, but not necessarily on the methodology. Because although, um, so I'll get a little, bit, a little bit boring here, a little technical, but while digital projects tend to be very agile, and quite lean in the way that they work. So you'll take a single idea, you'll test it, you'll run it out over two weeks, and if it works, you launch it into the public, and then you'll keep on doing that over and over, uh, kind of an agile workflow, um, which has worked really well for large software companies and digital platforms. Branding is still a change of digital platform, and it means that branding is a bit of a laggard. So while, say, Facebook will add hundreds of features every week, and it'll keep rolling it out in, in rolling updates, the Facebook brand itself, uh, the identity and the way that it manifests itself is still relatively static. Now, I don't think that's going to stay that way for long. I think everything is getting into shorter and shorter cycles. And um, I think the challenge is going to be coming from artificial intelligence. What happens when the story is stuck? Or you have multiple inputs to a story? How do you guess, get to that to find that narrative that speaks the truth? Yeah, yeah. So, do you think you can have multiple truths? No. So, I think that's one of the ways of unsticking. It's getting to the real truth, and the truth is not necessarily, um, you know, comfortable. It's not necessarily the side that you want to show to someone. But the truth is the truth, and it's 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 the it's what you have to live. You know, it's what you have to get out of bed every day and go and live. So, I would I would find the truth, and I would be I would honor it. Um, I think that's that's. That's a great start, and that means having difficult conversations, you know, with people perhaps who have their own view on things. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think that would probably be the beginning. You know, what, what is it really you're trying to do? You know, why are you doing it? What does it really mean? Um, and and have that conversation, and you'll find that people either jump on board or they they go to something else. But either way, you get unstuck. Does that help? Yeah. Specifically around creating a brand. Yes. Um, okay. So let me let me let me get the question again. Sorry. So it's about working out who you are. Yeah. But yes. But still have mainstream appeal. Why do you have to be enjoy what you're doing? Why do you actually have inspired to work? What do you? It is. It's not easy. So lives don't stay lives for very long. People figure you out quite quickly. Um, possibly, yeah. Yeah, but then you don't even want to have to go down that road. You know, I think what begins in truth um, often will, sh will shine through. So it's about finding something about you that, that's meaningful, that's honest, and then telling that story as clearly as you can. Um, and as a photographer, um, you know, telling the story of the way that you interesting and you're valuable. Yes, the story. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I think we're all interesting. You know, we're, we all have a great story to tell. It's, it's, it's the wonderful thing about people, right? We all see the world a little bit differently. And we're all yearning for new stories and new experiences. So it's, it's finding that aspect. Anytime you talk, talk to your audience. So business people, you, you, first thing you should be doing is figure out what they're really interested in. Um, if, you know, and chances are it's going to be the financials are going to be a big part of that, right? So what's the return on investment? So there's a lot of data out there which supports investing in brand um, as a way of uh, um, improving a balance sheet. You know, your brand is an intangible asset. Uh, the Economist estimates that up to a third of global wealth is attributable to intangibles like brand. So that's a third of all wealth globally. Um, and so ignore it at your peril. Um, what what someone who's not paying attention to that is doing is they're sitting on a huge well of untapped possibility uh, in, in their company. And what they're also doing is they are, uh, by limiting their story, they're limiting uh, its the radius of its appeal. They're limiting the number of people who 
uh, know about them and know about them in, a, in an honest way because also not having a brand means you're very vulnerable to other people coming in and, and saying other things because your story isn't clear, so who said, who didn't say. You know, you want to be strong and clear and articulate so there's no question about you and what you stand for. Uh, the other thing is that you are not being clear about future generations. So if you want to last longer than you know, the next financial year, then you need to start investing in things like this so that you have a story that can then continue um, you know, on to the I, 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 Yeah, kind of. But So it's more along the lines of educating them about the advantages, I guess. Right, so education is everything. I mean, uh, certainly from my experience, you spend a long time uh, explaining to people why you do, what it is you do. Uh, so what, why is it valuable? What's interesting about it? And, and in this, you can really stand on the shoulder of giants. I mean, you don't have to show your own work. 